from Vienna to introduce the uh, moderator PBSS Prasad. He is a vice chairman of EFA India and he is a chief mentor and senior partner of the firm Prasad and Prasad. He has over three decades of experience in dealing with international tax, transportizing, regulatory affairs and cross-border structuring. He had contributed several articles and views on emerging transferbasing economic issues, and he is a prolific speaker at very <coughs> national and international fora. Thank you, Mr. PBSS Prasad, for joining us and moderating this discussion. Professor Jeffrey Owens is currently the director, Global Tax Policy Center at the Vienna University. In the past, Jeffrey was the director, Center for Tax Policy and Administration, at the uh, OECD. He holds a doctorate from Cambridge University with qualifications in economic degrees. He is also a qualified accountant. He has focused his attention on questions on tax policy and tax administration with emphasis on international tax and related domestic issues. He has established a major taxation program at the OECD and extensively developed the OECD contracts with the non-member countries. Thank you, Jeffrey, for uh, joining us virtually. Over to PBS. And I, I, I could just add, in fact, that I'm a father of four and a very good friend of India's. Just to complete my CV, Thank you, Jeffrey, being available virtually. I, I can hear a lot of music in the background here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Prasanna, for the kind introduction. And uh, IFA, SRC Chairman T.C. Suresh, other office bearers, it's my pleasure to be here, part of this uh, deliberations today in the IFA conference SRC. So, uh, I mean, I mean uh, we are already shooting the time schedule and I will quickly uh, speak for about uh, four to five minutes uh, and request uh, Jeffrey to take over and make his uh, presentation. And uh, in fact, as uh, mentioned by IFA India Chairman, Mr. Mukesh in the morning, uh, it's the most happening time on in the international landscape and we recently had the honor of hosting G20 finance ministers meeting along with central bank governors at Bangalore last week. And uh, we could uh, read from the proceedings that all the inclusive framework, uh, I mean, jurisdictions have uh, endorsed their uh, commitment and will continue for this, uh, um, I mean, for a globally fair, sustainable, and modern international tax system uh, fit for the purpose of the 21st century. And the leaders have uh, remained committed to the swift implementation of the global tax deal, which was entered into by mo more than 135 countries on 8th October 2021, uh, in the form of pillar two, two pillar solution, what we know, pillar one and pillar two. And in fact, will, Jeffrey will take us through how certain these proposals are, whether they are going to create tax certainty, which is the most important thing now. <coughs> and pillar mm -hmm. one, uh, MLC is aimed to be signed. There is the multilateral convention is aimed to be signed in the first week, I mean, the first half of 2023, that is this year. We are already in the month of March, and it's a very ambitious uh, uh, schedule. And let us see how things move from now. And as, as you all know, pillar one is the digital taxation, reallocation of taxing rights to the market jurisdictions. And in fact, uh, Mr. Rajat Bansal is here, who is going to uh, take us through the dispute resolution process uh, in the next session. He is one who championed for the market jurisdiction, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, reallocation of taxing rights from the Indian side in the UN and all that. And pillar two, uh, as you all know, we have uh, uh, made a lot of advancement in pillar two. Pillar two is bro brought to the forefront as against pillar one. And we had the, I mean, uh, rules in uh, place uh, coming in December 2021 itself. And we have the commentary coming in March 2022. Now we also have the guidance that has come very recently this month. And guidance uh, will keep adding and uh, deleting certain portions in the commentary, which becomes uh, um, a, a living document for uh, years to come. And we have to see how this glo global minimum tax rules 
are going to uh, be in place in various jurisdictions. Of course, India has been silent on the, for the present. You would also observe uh, in the morning when Mukesh made a remark that uh, finance minister of uh, France made a statement that India, Saudi Arabia, and the US are at to uh, give the full and green signal. We do not know what are the implications of this particular statement. And uh, as of now, the, I mean, the, uh, the pillar two approach is surging forward with some sort of reservations and what it is we'll get to know. And uh, of course, uh, this global minimum tax is nothing but uh, going against the basic principle of taxation, uh, not at the place where the value is created, but tax will happen in a different jurisdiction if the taxation doesn't happen where the value is created. So this is what it is. And uh, we also have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, some other, uh, uh, I mean, we, it, uh, it's, uh, it has come to the knowledge that there is a letter written by United States House of Representatives to OECD expressing their concerns uh, over the use of undertaxed <clears throat> profit rule that is uh, UTPR and its potential to undermine the US tax incentives. As you know, the pillar two totally discourages the tax incentives and proposes a minimum tax of 15%. And uh, I think this has been uh, widely, uh, I mean, publicized stating that the US House of Representatives are not happy with uh, the EU, UT, UTPR uh, rule. And uh, let us see how it happens. And in fact, uh, there is also a mention in the press release that US may stop some of the grants to OECD if at all it's not taken care in the proper perspective. So uh, this is what it is. And uh, at this juncture, because we are running short of time, we are already overshooting the schedule. I would just stop here and request Jeffrey uh, to make his presentations. Then I will come back with some more questions for the discussion. And I will, will also invite questions from the audience. Thank you. Jeffrey, it's yours. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for that introduction. First, let me say it's, it's an honor, in fact, to provide this keynote speech um, at this conference. But I do have the regret that I'm not with you today, especially as I see in the audience, there are many of my good Indian friends. Um, in fact, it's been almost three years since I last visited India. And I must admit, I, I do miss my regular trips. I mean, generally, I would visit India twice a year. And I still have very fond memories. The last uh, visit I made was to Mumbai and Delhi, yes. Um, now, I had, in fact, forethought of picking up um, what the chair said about the, the two-pillar solution. But I asked myself, would I have much to add on to that, yes? Uh, I think as he emphasized the, the last G20 finance minister meeting, which was hosted by India, uh, there was a commitment to make fast progress. Um, there was a very ambitious timetable that was set. Um, I just wonder whether they'll be able to meet that timetable, particularly in the light of some of the difficulties they're having with the, with the United States. So what I thought I'd do this morning was to focus on the issue, which is closely linked to the debate on the two-pillar solution of how do you provide greater tax certainty in an uncertain political and economic environment, yes? And I'll build on some of the things that the previous speaker said, which focus very much on the Indian situation. So I'll try to put that debate, in fact, into an international context. Um, I'll first try to define what we mean by tax certainty, not an easy task. Then I'll explore the different initiatives that are internationally uh, that are trying to achieve it. I'll make some suggestions on how we can move forward on the debate on mediation. And I hesitate to mention in India the word arbitration because I know there's always a strong feeling about arbitration, which I think is a mistake. In fact, I think arbitration is the future. And then I'll finish by picking up a topic which I, I think is a neglected issue on the international scene, and that's cross-border VAT disputes. I was very happy, in fact, to hear the previous speaker mention about the increase in disputes in GST. Yeah? Um, and I'll finish up then by talking about what I think India can do domestically 
um, to improve the tax environment, yes, which is particularly important if India is going to attract more foreign direct investment, particularly foreign direct investment that would normally have gone into China, yes. Um, I'm not going to use any PowerPoints, so you're going to have to actually focus on what I say. I think PowerPoints can sometimes be a distraction, yeah? And I'd be very happy to answer questions um, at the end of the presentation. So first then, what, what's the current environment that we're living in at the moment? I think what we've seen is that over the last 15 years, we've gone through three crises. 2007, 2008, the Lehman Brothers crash um, almost brought down the hood of the global financial system, yeah? Why didn't that happen? Primarily because the G20 took a leadership role under Gordon Brown, yeah? And to me, this was one of the biggest and biggest successes of the G20. It showed we need a grouping like that when you're facing global issues. It's so a big success for the G20. Um, then what we saw is that before countries had emerged from the 2007-2008 crisis, we entered the COVID pandemic. And that, in fact, was a major issue economically, not just from a social or health perspective, because it disrupted domestic markets and it broke up global supply chains. In fact, it showed us that we must move from a position of just-in-time manufacturing to a position of just-in-case manufacturing. Yeah? Um, before we had exited from the COVID pandemic, uh, we entered into the Russian-Ukrainian war, which led to a spike in energy prices, in food prices, and that in turn led to double-digit double rates of inflation in countries, in fact, that had not experienced these high rates of inflation for over three decades. Yes? Um, so these three crises disrupted world trade and foreign direct investment. And in fact, if you look at data that came out of UNCTAD, um, it's only just now, almost 15 years after the first crisis, that FDI flows are beginning to come back to their pre-2007 levels. Yes? So it was a big source of destruction. Um, but more generally, I think what these three crises did, apart from making citizens very tired, making civil servants, making politicians very tired, because yes? it put enormous demands upon them, I think what it did was to lead to a number of consequences which we're still dealing with. One was what I call um, the growth of populism, yes? Um, and you see that in the recent elections you've had in Europe, you've seen it in the elections in the US, particularly President Trump being elected. Um, and that's something that we need to deal with in the tax environment. What are the implications of that? But what do we mean by populism? Yes. The second consequence was that there was a strong uh, movement against globalization. Um, and you can see that in all countries, including in India, yes. I think that's a mistake. Um, I think globalization has been a force for good. Globalization has brought about a billion people out of poverty, 500 million in India, 500 million in China, yes? Uh, yes, we do need to address the issue of are the costs and benefits of globalization being fairly shared? But what we should not be doing is actually saying that globalization is a force for evil. It's not, it's a force for good, yes? Um, I think the, the other uh, consequence of these three crises was we saw an increased emphasis on transparency, yes, not just in the tax area, but right throughout the uh, the, the business environment and, and the role of government, yes. And that in turn, I think, uh, led to some changes in the tax area. Um, uh, we're all aware that there's been this very lively debate on are multinationals paying their fair share taxes? Uh, an interesting date. I mean, I tend to avoid so associating tax and fairness together because it's very difficult to define what we mean by fairness. And it's also led to a debate of whether high net worth individuals are paying their fair share of the tax burden. Yeah? At the economic level, I think one consequence of these three crises was that the uh, deficits that governments were experiencing actually uh, was, were increasing. Um, what was happening was that governments were forced to spend more on health, governments were forced to spend more on defense and governments were forced to spend more supporting firms and workers to get through the crisis, particularly the pandemic, yes? Uh, and all that meant that, in fact, at the same time that expenditures were coming under pressure, uh, revenues were also coming under pressure. So the consequences was that most countries, in fact, were experiencing very high rates of government deficits, something that, in fact, they're, they're still dealing with today. Developing countries uh, were badly hit especially by the increase in food prices and energy prices and the cost of service in their public debt. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the, the head of the IMF, in fact, what she said at the recent G20 finance ministers meeting, which is hosted by India, as the chair said, 
uh, that these setbacks uh, have reversed the gains, and I'm quoting, have reversed the gains made by four decades in reducing poverty. Yeah? As I said, one billion people have been brought out of poverty. We now see, in fact, that many of these people are moving back into poverty. Yeah? So wh what about India? Well, India actually came through the crisis better than most countries. And it's slowly, too slowly in my view, taking advantage of the move away from globalization characterized by just in time to one characterized by just in case. Put another way, I think there's a real opportunity, in fact, for India to, to build upon the movement by large multinationals to follow what I call a Chinese plus one policy. Yes, India at this point in time should be attracting much more investment that would normally have gone into China. Yeah? And maybe partly because of tax, that's not, not happening to the extent that it should. So I think that that's the backdrop against which we must see the current G20 lead, lead debate um, on the two pillar solutions and more broadly the G20 debate on how do you provide greater tax certainty. So let me try to answer the question of what do we what do we mean by tax certainty? And and you know you could write a thesis on this, but I'll be I'll try to simplify and just make just two comments. One, tax certainty means that tax administrations act in a predictable predictable, consistent, and fair way, so the taxpayers are able to know in advance of undertaking the transaction what are the tax consequences. Yes. The second part of the definition is that taxpayers also need to know that if a dispute arises, whether domestically or internationally, they will be resolved quickly uh, and, and that's important, in a principled fashion. So quickly, quick resolution and on, on the basis of clear principles, that's how these disputes should be resolved. Now, none of this is easy in a fast change in international tax environment, uh, especially in fact, as we see the spread of digitalization. And it was interesting to hear the previous speaker, in fact, make the link between digitalization and dispute resolution mechanisms. This, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Let me now just focus a little bit on what the, um, what's the current state of the two pillar solutions? Um, as the chair said, I think pillar two, I see that moving ahead quite quickly. There's broad agreement. There's been a debate on does pillar two impinge on fiscal sovereignty? Yes, it does, but maybe in a good way, because I think too many developing countries have been giving away their tax base by means of tax incentives, particularly tax holidays. Yes? I think what Pillar do too is to, it builds up a momentum, in fact, to review these incentives and to move away. So I would expect quite quick progress on them. Is it easy? No, it's not. Uh, all the definitional issues that come in, the uh, questions of you know, how multinationals are going to comply with them, all of that, in fact, is going to raise some interesting issues. But I think the political momentum is there. So I, I think we will see quick progress on, on, uh, on Pillar 2. Pillar 1 is more problematic. Um, I ask myself, uh, what are the principles that underlie pillar one? It's quite hard. In some ways, in fact, you can see that it's it's not so much principles that are driving pillar one, but it's a, a political consensus around making certain concessions. Yes? And I think that's a little bit worrying. I think a question, another question on pillar one is, will we get a consistent implementation of the standards? It's one thing to get a political consensus. It's another, in fact, to get consistent implementation. I think a third question that I have on pillar one is, I mean, are governments underestimating the compliance costs for business? I think there tends to be an attitude that our business can do anything. Well, yes, they can, but the one should not be imposing an excessive compliance costs, in fact, on, on business. Uh, and I think also um, what will be the consequences, in fact, um, of pillar one for the, the the way that disputes arise between countries. And when disputes do arise on pillar one, how will the courts in fact interpret the pillar one? And that's where sometimes perhaps a lack of clear principles may be a, uh, any hindrances. Uh, so there's lots of uncertainty then around pillar one, to a lesser extent pillar two. But in this two, uh, two pillar solution debate, I think there is one certainty. And that's during what will be a long transitional period. This is not going to happen in one year, two years. It's probably going to take five to 10 years. This. So during this long transitional period, the one certainty is that it's going to lead to greater tax uncertainty. And the risk is that increased tax uncertainty may in turn lead to lower foreign direct investment, which is the main engine of growth in all countries around the world, yes? 
So that's why I decided I would focus, in fact, on that question of tax certainty, how we can achieve it. So what are what are the current mechanisms we have then to minimize and resolve disputes at the international level? Um, well, minimizing cross-border direct tax disputes, and I'll emphasize focus for the moment just on direct tax. Yeah, um, Here, in fact, we've seen some positive developments. Um, we've seen the spread of uh, uh, advanced pricing agreements. Uh, and I, I still remember, in fact, coming to India over 12 years ago and trying to persuade the Indian Revenue Authorities that APA is with the future. I'm very happy, as the previous speaker said, that in fact, APA has now become part of the Indian tax landscape. They're working quite well. Yes, maybe they need more resources in the, in the department that's dealing with them. But overall, I think that has been a big success for the Indian Revenue Service and for the Indian business community. Yeah? Um, what I would like to see in the APA area is a move in fact, a gradual move to make these multilateral rather than unilateral. I know that multilateral APAs are more difficult than unilateral, but multilateral APAs are a better way of providing greater certainty to the taxpayer. I think the other positive development in this area is the spread of rulings, particularly binding rulings. More and more countries, in fact, are prepared to give these rulings. Um, I like the fact that the rulings are now required to be published in the European Union. That improves tra the transparency in that. Uh, I think a third positive development is more countries signing up to ICAP, which is basically a multilateral initiative um, that's focusing very much on transfer pricing issues and country by country issues. Um, this new stage, in fact, that ICAP is moving into, I think, would be beneficial both for companies and, and for tax administrations. Uh, another area that has helped um, improve the tax environment is that more and more countries are taking up the concept of cooperative compliance programs or what our Dutch colleagues call horizontal monitoring. Yeah? Um, in fact, this is a concept that I launched when I headed up the OECD almost more than 15 years ago. Um, I'm very pleased to see that it's spread to many countries, not India, unfortunately, and I want to come back to that in a moment. Uh, and what's the main characteristic of these programs well, they are what perhaps ex-President Trump would refer to as a deal, a deal. The taxpayer provides greater transparency, and in return, the tax administration provides greater certainty. I think it's a very good deal for multinationals because already you are being required to provide unprecedented levels of information to tax administrations. So why not get something in return? And that's what you could get, in fact, if India were to enter into these cooperative compliance programs. This, um, so the deal is, you know, we provide you greater transparency, tax administrations provide greater certainty. Yeah, um, and more generally, what cooperative compliance is about is changing attitudes. It's moving away from you win, I lose attitude to an attitude of you win and I win. Yep, yeah, you win and I win. Um, we at the Vienna, in fact, we last year we published a handbook on how countries and, and multinationals could go about implementing cooperative compliance programs. This, um, and we're currently working with 15 non OECD countries to implement those guidelines. This, I would very much like to see India, in fact, engage in this multi stakeholder work groups that we have. And I think EFA India could play a key role here. And maybe, Mr. Chair, one thing that we could think as a follow up to this meeting is to have a, a joint meeting or a joint webinar between India, EFA, and Vienna on cooperative compliance. How would it be, could it be implemented in an Indian environment? Yes. What would be the legal barriers? What would be the cultural barriers? We'd be very happy to follow that up. Yeah. But overall, I think, yes, progress has been made uh, along the lines I've suggested, uh, but we do need a more open, a more constructive, a more respectful dialogue between tax administrations and taxpayers. And this would go a long way, in fact, to minimizing uh, disputes. I think that's really important. So what are the current mechanisms then for resolving cross-border direct tax disputes? Uh, primarily, these are, in fact, the Article 25, the MAP provisions that are found in almost all of the tax treaties that are around the world, the 3,800 tax treaties. Um, uh, after the BEPS recommendations and the creation of the FTA MAP Forum, I think it's fair to say there has been a significant improvement in MAP, and that was a point that was made by the previous speaker as well, yeah? But, and it's an important but, 
we do see that in, in many countries, new map cases are still being added at a quicker pace than old map cases are resolved. So the inventory continues to grow and that should worry us. Yes? Uh, a second concern is that in some countries, access to map is constrained. Um, and you know the, the BEPS recommendation, in fact, said there should be a, a much better route to, for companies in, to move into the map area. Um, I think a third concern is that taxpayer participation is still very limited in the area of map. That's a, I, I know there's a cultural issue here, but I think that that's something that we do need to change. And a fourth concern, uh, concern is that it can take quite a long time, in fact, to resolve a case, particularly difficult cases in, in the transfer pricing area. Yes, as the previous speaker said, there has been improvements in India, but significant improvements. But when I look around the world, in fact, I still see that in some cases it can take more than two years, even five years at times, to resolve a map cases. But the, perhaps the biggest concern about the map, and this is a point that was touched on by the previous speaker, it's the fact that there's no obligation on the competent authorities to come to a resolution. They must endeavor to find a revolution, but they're not forced to find a revolution. And there are still too many map cases, in fact, that do not result, even after many years of discussion, in a settlement. So I think these shortcomings has led the OECD to push the concept of mediation and a particularly a mandatory arbitration. Yeah, um, These are now both part of the multilateral convention that the chair referred to and the pillar one proposals. But I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of non-OECD countries, and let me emphasize non-OECD countries, um, including most less developed countries and India, they remain very skeptical about arbitration. And that's something that I want to re come back to because I think it's a really important topic. Um, the, the other positive development in this area is that recently, uh, last year, the United Nations Tax Committee uh, produced a handbook that I worked with them on, on how less developing countries could could both minimize and resolve tax disputes. And that handbook did include some proposals on the use of mediation, something that I think tax people don't use enough, but maybe they don't understand it, um, and on arbitration as well, yes. And what I would hope is that the, the existence of that handbook would perhaps change the attitudes of less developing countries and India um, to provide a greater confidence in the MAP processes. So if you haven't seen the handbook, it's worthwhile having a look at that as it was published in 2022. The other interesting thing, um, which is very relevant for India, is the, the way that some tax disputes get resolved by taking them to arbitration, mandatory arbitration under bilateral investment treaties. Now, India has seen a number of high profile tax disputes which have ended up in uh, arbitration, uh, investment arbitration panels. And in fact, um, some work that we've been doing with UNCTAD over the last two years is to analyze the cases, tax cases that have that have gone to investment arbitration. There's about 165 cases over the last decade, in fact, that have ended up in these panels. Um, some of these cases have a very strong tax dimension, the UCOS case, the Videophone case. Uh, some, in fact, tax is perhaps just a, a, a secondary issue, yes? The survey that we just completed with UNCTAD analyzed these cases and it showed that the main issues that arise are centered around the questions of national treatment, non-discrimination and fair and equitable taxes. Uh, what's interesting, I think, for the Indian debate is that roughly half of these 165 tax related cases were resolved in favor of the taxpayer and half in favor of the government. Yeah? which does suggest maybe something is, is quite an interesting to, to debate we could have on that. Um, nevertheless, um, you know, as a tax person, I'm not very keen on having tax disputes brought to an investment panel um, because generally the people that the arbitrators in these panels don't have that much tax expertise. There are exceptions. Um, but I think that um, uh, we, we should try to avoid, in fact, that these tax cases ended up in, in investment arbitration. But to do that, we in the tax community, we must improve the mechanisms that are available to resolve disputes under tax treaties. We can't say don't go to investment arbitration unless we actually improve our existing mechanisms, particularly the MAP, and in particular moving towards arbitration, yes? So I think that's a debate that we need to have over the coming years. Uh, what, well, what more can be done then? Um, to both minimize and, and uh, 
uh, to resolve these disputes. And in particular, how can we get non-OECD countries, particularly developing countries and countries like India, how can we get them to be more favorable towards mandatory arbitration? Yeah. Um, over the years, in fact, I talked to many developing countries to try to better understand what are their concerns with arbitration, uh, some of which are legitimate, some of which I don't buy. And I think the concerns can be divided into two categories. Yes? First, there are what I call procedural concerns. Uh, the fact that MAP is slow, um, the, um, and, and that, that clearly is, is an issue. Um, the, uh, that one, it lacks transparency. It's quite hard, in fact, to know what happens in a map because very little is published. Um, a third concern is that the arbitrators are a small group of people. Frankly, they're mainly white men from OECD countries. And these people may not be that familiar with the, the economic and the social environment in a developing country. Yeah? Uh, another concern is that the competent authorities in developing countries may not have the expertise to prepare an arbitration cases. So those are the procedural concerns that I've heard from developing countries. At the, the second type of, chair of concerns are political, and this is actually met, one of the first ones that was mentioned by the previous speaker. And this is this whole question of arbitration infringes on a country's sovereignty, yes? And then perhaps linked to that is that arbitration may not be consistent with the constitution. L let me first actually try to respond to those two political concerns. The question of sovereignty. Uh, you know, every time you sign a treaty, whether it's a tax treaty or an investment treaty or something else, you're giving away your part of your sovereignty. That's part of the deal. Hopefully you get something in return, yes? So I think arbit tax arbitration is no exception. Yes, it does imply that you give away a bit of your sovereignty, but you do that as part of a conscious decision to improve the environment within your tax environment within your country, yeah? So I don't buy the sovereignty concern. I, I recognize it's important, it has to be addressed, but I don't think it, it should be a major constraint on countries moving into arbitration, mandatory arbitration. The second political concern is the constitutional issues. Um, and I recall, in fact, when I was pushing the concept of arbitration, when I headed up the OECD, I talked to a lot of big OECD countries, countries like Japan, the UK and the US, and I heard exactly the same arguments that I'm hearing from India today. Yeah? It's against the constitution. My friends, when you enter into that discussion, and I've gone, in fact, to those countries with constitutional lawyers, and we've shown, in fact, that it's not against the constitution. And I know from my conversations with some judges, including some supreme judges in India, that their view also is that arbitration, in fact, could be designed in a way that it would be consistent with the Indian constitution, yes? So on the political level, um, I'm skeptical about both the arguments that uh, arbitration infringes a country's sovereignty or that it would be contrary to the constitution. Um, I have um, perhaps more sympathy um, on the um, on the procedural concerns because I think some of these are legitimate. Yeah? Many of them come from the fact that developing countries were not part of the process by which the arbitration pr provisions within the OECD program were developed. Yeah? Uh, and um, in fact, uh, and I think these can be addressed, and about five years ago, I published an article that proposed what, what I called a UN-based dispute panel, yes, that would try to address these procedural concerns um, uh, of developing countries. So what, 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 what did I propose there? One was that you set up objective criteria for the selection of arbitrators. So we get a more representative sample of arbitrators. Arbitrators that are familiar with the situation in India, in developing countries, emerging economies, and developed countries. Yes. A, a second proposal, in fact, was you would use then those criteria to set up a permanent roster of qualified arbitrators. And countries would have to choose from those arbitrators. Yes? And you could even have a provision that says you can't choose a, an arbitrator from your own country. Yeah? Um, key thing is to avoid what we have today, in fact, under arbitration, where you have one country chooses one arbitrator, another country chooses a second arbitrator, and then the two arbitrators argue for 12 months to decide who is going to be the chair because the chair will have the voting, uh, the, the final vote. Yeah? So that's the second pr proposal here, create a permanent roster of arbitrators. A third, 
is in fact, you can put a cost on a, a cap on the cost of arbitration. You sometimes see that happen. It should happen more often. Um, and you know, you could even build on the concept of tax inspectors without borders, the program that the UN and the OECD has launched. Maybe what we need is a program on arbitrators without borders. Arbitrators, in fact, who provide pro bono. Uh, 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 services to developing countries that enter into arbitration. Yeah, I think a fourth proposal to, to address the concerns of developing countries would be one could have greater uh, transparency by publishing redacted versions of the decisions, which would also help business, in fact, know why a particular case was decided in a particular way. Yeah, And then there's the question of capacity. A lot of developing countries tell me they just don't have the capacity within the competent authorities to prepare cases for arbitration. Yeah, um, But I think that can be addressed. And one way of doing that, which I suggested five years ago, uh, was in fact that anybody who is on the arbitration roster, any arbitrator that's on that roster, has to agree that for six months of the year, he would take somebody from a developing country and train them up. So in other words, we train up the next generation of arbitrators this and i think that would in part um, overcome the capacity constraints this. all of these proposals were meant to build up confidence in the integrity of the process yes um, and especially if the panel was under a un umbrella i think that would be the case because what we forget when we talked about arbitration, it took the OECD countries almost 20 years to get to the point where arbitration was acceptable. And even today, there's still some OECD countries that are reluctant in moving into arbitration, yes? So we need to go through this process of building up confidence on the part of developing countries, including India, that arbitration can be a good solution uh, for them. And I th think particularly for the, um, the small countries, that, that is a really important factor that we have that, yes. Now, I, I know that all of this would take time, um, and um, uh, but I do think that this is the, the moment, in fact, where we should be looking at, at these questions of how do we promote arbitration in the context of developing countries. Uh, there's an opening, a political opening coming up. I mean, you may be aware that in February, the UN passed a resolution to create a more inclusive framework for tax co cooperation. Maybe as part of that framework, we could visualize, in fact, having a UN tax dispute panel, a tax dispute panel that could deal with both mediation and arbitration, and that would be open not just to governments, but also to business as well. Yeah? Um, there's one last point that I want to make. I mean, up to now, I focus very much on tax, direct tax disputes. Um, and yet, when I when I look around the world, what I see, in fact, is that increasingly there are indirect tax disputes, GST, VAT disputes that are arising. And in fact, Vienna, we've just launched a study last year um, with the International Chamber of Commerce Tax Committee um, on what are the causes for these cross-border tax disputes? Why are they growing? Yes. Part of the reason that they are going is that today we have 160 countries, in fact, that now have VAT or GST. Um, and with the growth of e-commerce and digital services, there's more scope for conflict, yes? Why is this important? Because if there are unresolved VAT cross-border uh, cross disputes, and frankly, there are no mechanisms to resolve these disputes. You can't bring them under Article 25. Um, what this, the impact this has, in fact, on, on multinationals is it has an immediate impact on their liquidity position, and that in turn may influence their, their location decisions. In other words, if they would be hesitant about going into a location where they know they're going to have major problems on the VAT side. And I can give you examples of fact, companies that have decided not to invest in certain countries precisely because of that as well. Yeah. So I was very pleased to hear the previous speaker as he mentioned the, this, this question. Yeah. Um, so what we're trying to do with this project um, is to analyze the causes of the disputes, uh, VAT disputes, GST disputes, to look at um, what are the issues that give rise to these disputes and what mechanisms can we do, in fact, to resolve them more effectively? Do we need some sort of VAT international panel? Uh, could we imagine mediation in the VAT area? Could we imagine arbitration as well? Yeah. Uh, so that, that, in fact, is a program that is just, just starting. Um, as I said, it launched last year. Uh, I would very much like to have the Indian business community and government engage in this work. And again, this could be a topic, Mr. Chair, uh, where we could have a, a joint IFA India uh, Vienna uh, webinar so that we could tell you 
where we stand in this project, what are the issues and how could India actually participate uh, more actively here. Yeah? Let, let me conclude my presentation um, by just saying a few words on what do I see, what, what could India do at the domestic level to provide greater certainty? And I want to pick up one or two of the points that were made by the previous speaker and some of the points, Mr. Chair, that you made as well. I think first I would ask what can be done at the level of tax policy? Yeah? First, make an effort to make sure that the legislation is unambiguous and clear, leaving little or no room for unintended misinterpretations. A second thing that can be done at the level of tax policy is that you must make sure that the legislation realizes the policy aims determined by government, determined by government, not by officials. The third thing you can do is to design the law to minimize administrative costs, striking the right balance between tax compliance and the burden on taxpayers. I think a fourth thing that can be done is that as far as possible, the legislation should be in line with international standards and best practices. And I think India is definitely moving in that direction, yes? And then finally, the leg legislation needs to be based upon a principle-based approach. That's very important. At the level of the tax administration, I think what, what India can be doing is to incentivize the tax administration uh, so that they are, in fact, capable of applying the tax legislation in accordance with the, the letter and the spirit of the law, yes? And I know spirit of the law is a controversial concept, but I think that's important. I think a second thing that the tax administration can do is to make sure that it has the resources needed to actually deal with these cases. And we've heard, in fact, that this has always been a problem in India. Maybe not enough resources are put into a dispute minimization, dispute resolution. And, and also perhaps not enough uh, thought is given into how you can use the new technologies, in fact, to improve these processes. And, and there's an enormous potential there, yes? Um, uh, the, the other thing I think that's important for the tax administration is they must have a better understanding of how business functions. Yes? And that's where cooperative compliance is important because when you enter into a cooperative compliance program, let's say with a pharmaceutical company, you understand better how that, that whole sector operates. Yes? So there's many things then that can be done at the level of the, uh, the tax administration uh, to improve um, the the environment. But business also has a role to play. If you want tax certainty, business, you must make a contribution. Yes. What is that? What is that? What do I mean by that? Um, in fact, I think it it it's first you have to look at your tax control framework and you have to ask yourself, well, is this a well-functioning tax control framework? Uh, does it link business reality with tax compliance? and ensuring the availability of the right information at the right time, yes? Um, does the tax control framework provide accurate, full and timely information? Uh, is it in fact, is it information is it consistently provided between two different tax administrations? And one of the things that we're doing at the moment at Vienna is looking at this whole question of the tax control framework. And could we establish some sort of international standard on what's an acceptable tax control framework? Because for large multinationals, their tax control framework, it's the same whether you're in India, Brazil, or in, in the UK, yes? So could we have an international standard on that? So those are some of the things then that I think that India needs to explore at a, a domestic level. Let me conclude, Mr. Chair, by saying that, um, you know, we do live in uncertain times. Our, our economies are held back by a reluctance of multinationals to invest in sustainable, inclusive investment, despite having significant amount of cash. Uh, so what we must avoid is that taxation adds to this uncertain environment. And here, I think India, in its role as president of the G20, could play a lead role. There are many issues I could pick up, in fact, that, that, that in the international debate. I'll just mention them briefly. This whole question of interagency cooperation, I think, is a key one. I think we need to have more dialogue on how do you redefine taxpayers' rights in a digital environment. Um, uh, so, uh, and also, what is what are what are the opportunities that digitalization offers us to completely change the nature of the dialogue between tax administrations and taxpayers? I'll stop there. I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jeffrey, for a very quick uh, exposition on the current developments and your thrust on the tax certainty. I could really read. Uh, between the lines that tax certainty is very, very critical. And in fact, uh, your uh, points are well taken.
and uh, you also mentioned at length about the map resolution process which should be in place very effectively and in fact we have a full length session on dispute resolution now coming up in the next next session mr rajat bansal is going to uh, talk about that and uh, we are running short of time and anyhow uh, i would uh, also noted your uh, uh, i mean points on arbitration why india is not accepting the arbitration process where other countries have accepted and india has always taken a position that it would infringe on our sovereign rights and which you explained in your own way how it affects sovereignty i do agree and you also mentioned about the technology inputs and how you use the technology uh, to speed up the dispute resolution mm -hmm. and that's a very important area where we have to really put in our uh, best uh, efforts to see that how we can achieve in speeding up the resolution uh, dispute resolution process so before that uh, i would quickly uh, take you through pillar 1 and pillar 2 with just two questions uh, uh, first i would go to pillar 2 because uh, we are running slightly behind schedule i would go to pillar 2 i would just put a question which is very interesting because uh, there is so much of thrust being placed on pillar 2 and the global minimum tax and all that uh, is it not uh, because uh, some of the scholars are of the view that pillar 2 would have a direct conflict with the tax treaties that are in place today what is your view on that the pillar 2 can operate without modifying the tax treaties to that extent that is the globe rules can they operate independently or would they have a direct conflict with the tax treaties because tax treaties have got tax pairing clause even india has got tax pairing clause with singapore and other countries how do we harmonize this situation yeah i think and that's a very good sorry that's a very good question um you know one first one should recall that there are a number of countries for many years that have had minimum taxes and they've been able to operate those taxes in a way which is consistent with their tax treaties yes um so i think that's an issue that can be resolved yes it's a bit more difficult when you have tax sparing clauses but you know frankly again the trend in fact in countries is to move away from these tax sparing clauses uh, and i've i've never actually been a big fan of tax sparing so answer the question is i think they can be the minimum tax is can be designed in a way which is is consistent with your your the your tax treaty obligations as yes. you had a second question now that is the first thing and uh, about tax incentives uh, as i mentioned in my opening remarks the house of representatives of us um have a very serious uh, reservation about the incentives being impacted by the uptr rule so that would be the same place for any country and in fact india now showcases the gift city as a big investment destination and the incentives would definitely be offered in that way so is it a a a a time when we have to shift to non tax incentives um, to meet with the globe to rules Yeah that, again that's a very good question. Let let me link the two questions with just for one moment yeah. Where I think there could be a challenge to the the minimum tax proposals is under um investment agreements as yes? both government to business investment agreements and government government yeah bilateral investment treaties because you could say that the the fact that a country would eliminate certain types of tax incentives would actually be contrary to some of the provisions that you find under, under the investment treaties um on on your second question um the us um i i actually i'm pretty optimistic that the us in fact will buy into the the pillar 2 uh pillar 1 is a bit more difficult um the 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 question to me is that the countries that sign up to pillar 2 will be required in fact to review all of their tax incentives don't forget there are many areas in fact uh, that are excluded from pillar pillar 2 um but i think in fact the um it will require countries such as india to look at the use of tax incentives it will require india to look at the use of special economic zones and that's going to be a big issue not just for india but for china i mean china built its development on the use of special economic zones um and you're absolutely correct in saying that 
even with this constraint on what you can offer in terms of tax incentives, governments are going to want, in fact, to use incentives still use incentives to attract investment. So what would I expect them to do? One, I, I would think they would look at how they can use other tax incentives in the area of VAT, in the area of social security, in the area of transaction taxes. Secondly, I would expect that governments would look at the use of non-tax incentives, the free provision of facilities, uh, the use of grants and expenditures. Yes. So in a sense, you know, tax competition, it's like a balloon. When you push on one side, the air comes out on another side. So what we'll see, in fact, is a shift away from traditional tax incentives, particularly the incentives like tax holidays, to different types of tax incentives and non-tax incentives. And that's going to raise a whole new ball game. And just one, one, one other comment on, on the non-tax incentives. What I see happening today is that many governments recognize that behind any investment, there are people. Yeah, there's the movers and shakers. So what they're doing, they're offering special tax regimes, in fact, to the individuals under the corporate income tax. You can see it in India, you can uh, you can see it in Italy, you can see it in many in Portugal, you can see it in Greece, you can see it in a whole range of countries. So there's a new ball game opening up here, a new form of tax competition, which is for high, high uh, for the basically what I call the movers and shakers. Thank you. Uh, one quick question on pillar one. Do you think that by 2023, uh, all the inclusive framework jurisdictions would be on the same page with respect to withdrawal of uh, unilateral tax measures? Uh, in, in fact, India has uh, equalization levy and all that. Hmm. And uh, because there are apprehensions that the tax collections uh, may not compensate what is being at least collected now or may not overshoot that, and how this is going to be addressed, how you would achieve a consensus uh, with respect to withdrawal of unilateral tax measures for pillar one to be in place. Yeah, you know, uh, the G20 doesn't engage in failure. Yeah. So pillar one is going to be a political success one way or the other. They haven't put all this effort in just as I said, we failed. So they will succeed. The danger is that, in fact, the success, the success will just be a political agreement, yeah? And that the implementation will then be left very much to how countries interpret it, yeah? Um, and I think the, the question you raise is really the key one. In, let's say in five years' time, will countries' expectations as regards the extra revenue that they get from pillar one Will that materialize? Yeah. And that's yeah. an open question. If it doesn't materialize, what will happen is they'll reopen the negotiations. Yes. And that's not a not a very desirable thing. And then linked to that is the whole question of the equalization taxes, you know, digital service taxes. Yes? I think a lot of developing countries, and maybe including India, will be reluctant, in fact, to give up these taxes until they're absolutely sure that the revenue that they get from these taxes, which in some cases can be quite significant, is going to be compensated by the revenue they would get from implementing the Pillar 1 solution. I agree, but there is also a thought process that Pillar 1 targets only the top 100 or 110 companies and uh, the other market, the other part of the market is left out, which is not yeah. being brought under tax. So that uh, is always I a concern from UN. United yeah, and I, I think that's a concern that a lot of people are, you know, you basically are setting up a system. Well, we have two systems. We have the existing system, which is already complex, and now we have a new system that applies to 100 multinationals, yes, which is even more complex. Yes? So we've added a level of complexity onto that. Yes? And it, it's, it's, perhaps we need to reflect, is, is this the way we want tax policy to go, to actually be targeting, in fact, you know, 100 multinationals? Uh, unless we expect, in fact, that this, these are a pilot study and that the proposals that are, that are under Pillar 1 will be extended, in fact, to a much larger group of companies. That's, so I think, a very good point you made there, which could raise issues of non-discrimination. Yes. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Really excellent uh, exposition. Your clarifications uh, are very, very apt. And uh, we are very fortunate to have you virtually. We would have loved to have you physically here in person. For our next I would have loved event. to be in there, Mr. Chair. I would have loved to be in there, yeah? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one last question which would give, I mean, which is very, very relevant today. See, with all the material coming from OECD day in and day out, we talk about the multilateralism. See, multilateral convention in respect of pillar one to be in place by 2023, mid-July or so. Uh, 
and you need to again come up with another multilateral convention for the subject to tax rule under pillar mm -hmm. two how many mlis we would have in place we have to see that way i would say the multilateralism is overshadowing the age old bilateralism i and agree uh, is that we are pushed into a bandwagon and we have to agree to what all the larger groups is is that see the consensus is always very very precious we are not denying that but in the process sometimes we are losing our own independent thought process and uh, whether the bilateralism is being eclipsed by the multilateralism in the years to come well um i would respectfully disagree yes i think it's a good thing that the tax community is bucking the trend of the move away from multilateralism if you look at other areas where there's investment in um, the tendency is in fact to say multilateralism is dead in the tax area multilateralism is alive and kicking and that's a good thing because by nature in fact global taxation is multilateral so if you can get groups of countries agreeing in fact to, to implement solutions that are consistent by means of multilateral treaty conventions that is a um, that is a positive thing. Let, let me just add, just to pick up two points I made earlier. One, we in Vienna would be very happy to work with um, IFA India, both on the, cross, co the, the, con the, the concept of cross-border tax disputes and on cooperative compliance. And that may give me a chance, in fact, to visit Chennai in person, yes? Thank you. Anyhow, uh, I'm very happy to have your uh, observations and uh, in the limited time available, we could, uh, take the audience through some of the critical points. And uh, uh, we have a, an exciting session uh, next following this uh, technical mm -hmm. session is again with respect to the dispute resolution and dispute prevention. We have uh, an, a very interesting session. So I, I cannot cut into um, that session's mm -hmm. time. And thank you very much, Jeffrey, for all the, for all your, uh, I mean, uh, um, time uh, being allotted to IFA. India and uh, if I SRC in particular, and uh, is there any scope for one question from the audience or anything? Huh? We have to close. Thank you. I'm sorry we don't have time, mm -hmm. and uh, then I will uh, give it back to the organizers. Uh, Vignesh can take over. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Mark. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Prasad. Uh, it was indeed a great session to have moderated and a apt keynote session for today's uh, program. Uh, may I now call upon Mr. Sriram Sheshadri, uh, past chairman of IFA Chennai, to hand over a virtual memento to our speaker, Prof. Professor Dr. Jeffrey Owens, please. Current president has to be there on stage. Please come. I now request uh, Mr. Shiram to also hand over a memento to our uh, chairman of this session, Mr. P. V. S. S. Prasad. Jeffrey, that's a mentor for you, Jeffrey. Thank you. And uh, we now move on to the next uh, technical session. Thank you, Jeffrey, for your time. That's a pleasure.